Hello. Cool, come in, grab a seat. We will start. Okay. So this week I want to introduce you to RCPP. And what RCP will let you do is let you embed C++ code inside R. So the reason you might want to do this is Last time we looked at map functions, and map functions are great, but sometimes you end up writing these horrible map functions when what you really need is a for loop. Sometimes your code would be so much easier to read if you could just use a nice simple for loop. Markov chain is a classic one. Trying to vectorize stuff like that or trying to do map function just makes it complicated and nasty. Windows, stuff like that, you are so much better just eventually embracing the fear that is RCPP and just write yourself a for loop. So, good morning. Oh, that's not what I want. That's really weird. So, RCPP. The trick to RCPP is you need to have a compiler underneath that cover. So hopefully all by now, all of you have got this sorted out. I cannot help you sort it out if you're on Mac you need to install X Windows, sorry, X tools. If you are on Windows, you need to get R tools. If you're on Linux, you need to get something similar. Seriously, every time you need to do it, your friend is the internet. Go search how to do it. The reason I don't go through in details is by the time I have got to this day today, the instructions would have changed. Here's our prerequisites. We're going to do tidyverse, forecast, read Excel, RCPP, and micro benchmark. Hopefully, before you got in today, you copied and pasted this into your R console, you ran it, and you got the answer six. Good. Right, let's actually do our first ever RCPP file. So let's go to R Studio. And to do it, you just go up to the top. You go File, New File, and you will have C++. Yours won't have quite as much. I'm using a development version of our studio, which is why I've got things like stand files, etc., and Python, and other things. But you click on this, like that, and you should get something that looks like this. This is a standard RCPP file. And we'll go through what's important. To actually get this to do something, you are going to save it. I'm going to save it on my desktop, and I'm going to call it first file dot, and then it's cpp is the extension. Your shortcut keys work exactly the same. If you normally run your R by going command shift return, or by clicking the source button, you do exactly the same. You run it, and if everything's working, this will take a bit of time, and it's now compiled it. In fact, it's compiled it, and it's run it. So let's break down what this file is doing. Majority's file is not needed. Everything with the dash dash is comments. So let's get rid of all the comments, except for that one there. And then let's get down here. So what we've actually done. First of all, you need these first two lines. The hash include rcpp.h. Whenever you do C++ code, you can get other functions. This is the equivalent of where we go source in R. You might have your function in another file. This is the equivalent of saying, the stuff out there you're going to need for this, that's where it is. It's in what we call header files. Using namespace rcpp just says the certain little functions, you know how we've been doing packages and we'll sometimes go something like glue, colon, colon? and then you'll have your function. The correct term is saying that function is contained within, that's what the colon colon means, this particular namespace. A namespace is just a group of functions and stuff together. So by doing that, it now means that the certain functions I don't have to go rcpp colon colon and then the name of the function. Line five is really important, that one basically says, once you finish this and you've created this compiled function, can you let R know about it? Can you export it into R? Okay? So, what have we got now? The next thing is our function, which... So, you've got, first of all, you've got a thing that says numerical vector. 
That is telling RCP what this function will return. It will return a vector of numbers. And that's the first thing you have to do, it's important. R needs to know, it's allocating memory, it needs to know exactly what it's going to return. Then you have the name of the function, then you have the arguments, and again, you have to let R know precisely. You can't just go, here's a vector. You have to say, this is a scalar, or an integer, or a numerical vector, or a matrix, because it needs to allocate memory. Then we've got our return, so this is just going to take your vector x and times it by 2. Couple of gotchas. Notice return doesn't have brackets around it. Whenever you return a function in R, you've had brackets. You don't use that. Return is a keyword, it's not a function, you don't have brackets. Notice also that the line has a semicolon. Every line in R has to have a semicolon so it knows it's the end of the line. Okay, that is it. When you run that on its own, it creates a thing in R. It just creates a function. As far as R is concerned, it's a function. You can use it like you use any other function. You know, I could go and have an R script and I could go x equals 1 to 10 times 2 x and it just does it. As far as R is now concerned, it's just a standard function. It's just a fast function. The other nice thing about RCPP is it's really nice if you could compile it and run it at the same time so you're not going to another file or going to your console and type in times 2 to make sure it works. So RCP has this very nice little thing. If you go slash dot 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 r dot slash, you can put direct r commands in there. And what it will do is it will take your RCPP, it will compile it, it gets function, and then go to that and go, it's like this little driver, I will test that it works. So, how many people have got that to work? All of you? Good. That's about all you need to know about RCPP. I didn't see the how you build it thing. You click the source button. No, yeah. Like that. Or if you don't want to click the source button, you can actually run this whole thing by going command shift. You gotta save it, yes. Test.cfp. You might, because you haven't put it dot you can see. So, here's the key points. You must start with that. You can include extra headers. There is things like RCP armadillo that does matrices, etc. Warn you now, every time you try and get them, there's a little bit, you're going to lose an hour of your life roughly to get them to actually recognize that you've got it on your system, etc. Yes. Does it matter where you do the RCPP explorer? Um, you have to have it just before every function. If you have functions, you can have more than one function in a file, but you'll only be able to get from R the one. CPP will be able to see other functions, which might be, say, hypothetically useful for something you might do in an assignment at some point in the future. But if you want R to be able to see it, you need a single export just before every function. Functions must define the type of variables for each input. They must define the type of variables for output. There is no brackets in return, and every line ends with a semicolon. The other gotcha. At some point, you will forget that all vectors and all matrices start with zero in CPP. And the thing about CPP is if you say, go and write this bit of memory, it will write this bit of memory. It won't say things like, you know you're about to write over my operating system, it will just write it. So every so often, you'll be running your RCPP and your not does your R Studio go, I've got a bit of a problem, it will crash completely. It will start and you will get a big blue window with a bomb that's been lit. You, there's nothing you do that, you just close it down. Luckily for you, it doesn't actually wipe out your operating system, it just wipes out R Studio's operating system, you restart it. The classic thing you do, you either haven't closed some brackets or you went and did something stupid like going, I've got a vector of size 10, I want to send the 10th entry to this, and you've wiped out something. The other thing sometimes is you'll read and you'll get all these numbers and there'll seem to be one out and it will go something like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then this horrible hexadecimal number. Because C won't say, oh, by the way, I start at zero. 
So when you ask for the 10th entry, you're actually asking for the first entry in my memory that was just beyond that vector. So yeah, just these are the, the key gotchas. Right, write a function. Have a go at writing your first ever function. with this, I would write my R function first, then I would copy paste into Z++ and convert it. You know, if you're not sure, you know, we remove that two levels of abstraction. Write the function in R, once you go in R, go back and write it in C++. Also the advantage is, by now you should know your R code, so now you can test your function works because you can run your R function version and your C++ version function and make sure they give the same answers. Also, when you're writing your function, please think how you can test it actually works, other than it didn't wipe out our studio. I have one chocolate frog remaining. I was hungry. So, the first person to get me something that works will get the chocolate frog. You about to tell me you've got it working? Put me in sine zero, sine forty two, sine minus one. I mean, that's not all the numbers, but. What do you have to do? Check it out. Yeah, check it out. Nice. It's very cool function, but I'm glad enough to look at your code. <laughs> <laughs> What's your code? You can you can you can tell the hacker mentality, and obviously he pays for characters by the dollar. Nice code though. But I'll show you my version, which means that the rest of the group. <laughs> it's very nice though. I might steal that. It's an old C. It's an old C hack. Yeah, it's a very nice hack. Yeah. So why doesn't it have one R type here? Because otherwise it would be a C type. Like, you can do it after the same R. Yeah, but why doesn't it fill in? No, it seems to lie because it's, you know, it is C code and RCP is just doing the graphic around for you. Yeah, right. I thought it would want to return an R integer. But something it wants to yeah. It should also complete on them as well. In fact, I think you can type if you can type capital I integer, it will also return that. Didn't didn't well Yeah I used int. I must admit I did use int on mine. How do people go? All done? All done? All done? Yeah. What were the main gotchas? Did you all just write it down at first, right first time or did you find oh, yeah. you got there? Because like, if you think normal R warnings are bad, you wait till you get C++ warnings. It, you know it's insulting you, but it's insulting you in Aramaic or something like that. I have no idea. And that's if you get the warning. As I said, sometimes it just goes eh, eh, and it's gone. So, um, there's more than one way. We've now discovered the leak way of doing it, which is very beautiful. You should all look at Ben's version, but here's my version. 
My version is to be really boring and really easy to follow. So, first of all, what we're classing again, I'm going to pass in an integer. Obviously, this is not going to work if I go 3.0. So I might want to change that to be a bit better. It's going to return. I often call my functions underscore CPP, so I just know that the code is CPP. If statement, if x is equal to 0, return 0. Notice no brackets. Else, if it's less than this, if it's not one of these two cases, you must return 1. That's it. Also, you know, everyone goes and does sine of 42 for some reason. I did 42 minus 42 and 0. You know the possible cases, test the possible cases. If you want to break it and go further, you could now try going sine, because it's always worthwhile going, what's it going to do if I give it 4.1? I assume it's going to break. No, it didn't break. Yeah, so you need to know these things. I don't know. You can now explore it and find out. But by putting the appropriate test functions in there, we're not going to get, never assume anything, test it, find out. Something must have coerced it, because let's see if it won't take. It shouldn't. So. so, next one. Um, if you go to the zip file, you'll find high balance files. This one will be called something like vect or whatever. Open that, run it, then work out what it's doing. You can either type it directly, or if you go to the web page, there's a zip file of all these things, so you can open them. Now, obviously, trying to work out what John's code is doing should be nice, because I write it so it's beautifully indented and it isn't really clever. Trying to work out what Ben's code is is going to be a more challenging problem, shall we say? It's just good code. It's, I didn't say it was bad code. Did you divide by the number of it and do something different than zero? No, I did. X is greater than zero minus X is less than zero. If it was greater than C returns one zero for true or false. But it's like it's an old trick. Okay, has everyone got that to work? What does it do? So first of all, what gets passed in? So what's x? Cool. So it's going to be a vector of numbers. What is mean? Double. Double. So you have decimals. What's sd? Double. So you know that's what's going to be passed in. So the main thing is, the first one is a vector, the last two are scalars. So int n equals, so notice I'm getting a thing called x dot size. What do you think that does? Gets the length of the vector. You're going to need that. It doesn't know automatically. It's like length. So notice, first of all, you can do this thing where you can pass a vector and there's methods. So you can actually call methods in C++. So x is an object and it has a method and you get the method by going dot and then you get the size. <laughs> there will be a better explanation of oop in R terms. But all you need to know is that vectors have things you can do to them and one of them is dot size. That's going to return a integer. Even in my internal code, everything has to be allocated memory. You must let RCP know. So in this case, I go in, I want to store the answer in a variable. You can't just go n equals this. You have to go the size of the memory you're going to need to record this number is an integer size. That's what int n means. I'm also setting up a new vector, norm x. So that creates a blank vector of size n. Then I do my for loop. This is a for loop. Okay, so how does it work? It has three parts. First of all, I'm going to have something to count my for loop. So I went int i equals zero, so it's going to start at zero. Notice the zero vector starts at zero. It's going to keep going until i is greater, sorry, until i is no longer less than n. 
And at the end of each loop, it's going to do something to that i. In this one, that's the final thing, the plus plus i, or i plus plus. There's a simple difference between them I'm not going to go into. But the plus plus i just says, take i and add 1 to it. So it comes along and goes i equals 0. It does whatever it does. It gets to the end. And it goes, right, i is now then 1. It goes back to that and says, is it greater than or less than n? Keep going. That's your standard for loop in C and C++. The rest is quite nice. The norm x, the brackets i, is very similar, luckily for us, to r. And basically it's taking each xi, minus in the mean, divided by the standard deviation. Semicolon at the end, and then I return it. So it's going along this vector, and it's taking each value, dividing it by the mean, sorry, minus off the mean, and divided by the standard deviation. So it's a normalization function. Key gotchas. The zero, the for loop, the semicolon. We all forget the semicolon. You will be reminded numerous times in very angry red writing that you forgot the semicolon. And just making sure you get this thing could not take a matrix. This thing could not take booleans. This thing, it would, well, the worst case scenario is it would have a good go and give you rubbish. The best case scenario is it would stop and tell you it won't accept it. So then all I did is I created um, a thousand random normals, I calculated the mean and standard deviation, and then I just normalized it. So, why bother? Because let's face it, there's my R version of the same function. I have badly written my R code. I would not write R code like this, I would just vectorize it. But I wanted to prove that the equivalent for loop in R and the equivalent for loop in RCPP, it is worth buying your time. Of course, you would vectorize. This is a thing you could, it was a catch 22. I wanted something that was simple for you to understand, but you know, I would never write R code like that. I'm just trying to say, that's not my R code. That is a student's R code, that's bad R code. Bad, bad, in your bed R code. It has a four loop. But anyway, micro benchmark, you can see that it's not just, you know, a tenth of the speed, it's even more than that. As soon as you get anything big or huge, you really need RCPP. So we can now get vectors in and out, we can get scalars in and out. How do you deal with matrices? Here's your code. Grab it, run it. Work out what it does. You've got a couple of minutes. Is it possible that it's easy to index a whole column? Like yes. I, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm quite good that, but I don't know how to word that question. I'll try like index the first column. I always have to look up. You know what I mean by that? Like, uh, yeah. Page to comma, you get the whole thing. Um, there is a. Somewhere down here it has an example. It doesn't say it specifically, but it has an example. Um, it comes to syntactic sugar, and it's there, that one. See this one, xx bracket, underscore comma. That will get the first column. So you can. Thank you. Okay, so what does this do? You can look at the code or you can read the name of the function. Does it give you the row sums of CPP? Yeah. yeah. Well, it gives you the row sums using CPP. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would make much more sense. Okay, so pretty much the same. I've got two for loops, I've got my double, I keep a count on that. I'm using plus equal. Plus equal just is short term for saying total equals total plus whatever you've got. The reason I've got it there is not that you have to do it, it makes your code harder to read, but if you read other people's code, you will see this a lot. Nice and easy. So you now have got a template for vectors and matrices. Okay. 
I want you to take this one, I want you to run it, and I want you to tell me why this title is called Printing and Warning. Have a go. So, first of all, why do you call printing? Yeah, first. If you think about it, if you're writing C++ code, every so often you just want to say, can you please just tell me what you think you've actually got here? So that line, so you actually don't need the RCPP, I'll just put it there, but this basically says, you're going to write some stuff out to R. This is the concatenation. So it says, open up something you're going to write, then give me X, then give me an end of line. So you can actually build up little, little trace functions inside your CPP to print out what's happening. But the nice thing is you don't have to go and print the whole thing. It's clever enough because if you just give it a vector or a matrix, it will print the whole vector or matrix. You don't have to write an individual print function to break it all apart we should normally have to do with CPP. So it's actually very nice. It's clever enough that this line, the first line just prints out the matrix X. So it's really nice, that line, to just go, what is X doing? Because, you know, when it's not working, you have to try and trace it. But here's the problem, it's the second line. The second line is double M, it's another function. Double M returns nothing. All it does is it takes my vector X and it doubles, um, the first car, first row, second row, second row. Yes, I keep forgetting. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. But remember, normally if you've ever done any R before, <coughs> if you run a function on a matrix and then back to that matrix, that matrix would not change whatsoever, would it? Everything in R is what we call pass by value. It was created that way. The idea was it was data was set aside. You do not mess around with it unless you specifically say mess around with it. So in R, you would go double M, and then when you go back to M, it would be exactly the same. In fact, if you know anything about R, if you really wanted X to be the one that had the double row, you would go X equals double M X. Yes? That's the standard, it's a this classic thing you do, you do all this fancy tidyverse, you mutate all the columns, you come back, and all that beautiful mutate columns have disappeared, because you never saved it as a new thing. And often you just save it over the top. That's called pass by value. It's really good to make sure you don't change your data unless you specify changing your data. It's really annoying because what happens is every time you do a pass by value, it creates a new copy of your data. So if your data, and we'll see this when we get to data tables, is 20 million rows of DNA data when you call that function, it grabs that data and it copies the 200, which in your case will be 1.2 gig of stuff into new memory. 
RCPP does not do this. Within, outside of R, it does it. Within R, when I call that function, it actually changes. The second time you printed X, X should now change. So you need to know that, first of all, RCP will be faster because it's passed by reference. It's also more dangerous. It will change your data inside. So that's the warning. You can also get distributions, just in case you need it. Um, so here, what I've done is I've created a random walk of length n. We're going to have, basically, the random walk is just going to start at the point zero, and it's just going to add normal noise and just keep walking along. You can see the R norm command. Um, even though I've asked for only a single random normal, it still passes it back as a vector. So I actually have to grab it by using the bracket zero bracket. So there isn't a give me a one single random normal value. It will give you a vector of length one. You still have to grab that position using the square brackets zero. And obviously, if you can do that one, and you get there's a lot of functions built in that you can grab. But not only do you have the R norm command, you have the D norm for the distribution, the Q norm, etc. So you've got all your distributions built in automatically, which is useful if you want to do things like Markov chains, give sampling, any of them sort of statistical methodologies. Cool. Any questions with RCPP? It's really useful. To be honest, every so often you just have that single function, you just go, if you just write this as a for loop, it could be fast. If you just go and write it. Takes a bit longer. I write this R first to make sure I've got the idea. I copy paste the CPP, I just slightly convert it, and then I can compare the two on a small data set. Now I've got a fast version. It's good. Um, if you want to source it in, put in another file, you just go source CPP and then the name of the .cpp file, and that's ready in the function ready to go. Okay. So we've been talking about speed, let's talk about profiling. So I've got some example code here. And all I want to do is I'm going to run this, and sometimes you run your code and it's slow. And the question is, why is it slow? Can you find out why it's slow so you can speed it up? Because the thing about R is the bits that slow you down are not necessarily what you think is going to slow you down. Now, R Studio has profiling built in. So if I go to um, my code, which I can't remember what I called it. Uh, might not put it in there. Let me go to the workshop. So if we go down to my example code, so there's my code. Okay. And let's say I run this and I want to make it really, really fast. I can try and work out how it's fast. The best way of doing that is you just highlight the whole code. You go up here to profile and you go profile selected lines. Maybe too fast? No. It just needs a So it's running that, and then it comes up with this. You can also, if you have a lot of code you want to highlight it, you can actually click a start profiling, do a load of stuff, stop profiling, and then it will come up with this diagram. And what this is doing is it's been measuring your memory and saying how long things take. So for example, you can see up here, you can see the time and memory it used. So this was particularly heavy the as tibble part and you can see down here you got the as tibble the matrix the r norm so in this you might have thought well maybe it's the ply that takes the time maybe it's this for loop that takes the time but once you actually profile it, you see no it's the creating the data that takes the time so then you go and search on the internet and say how can i create data fast so maybe in this case you don't do as tibble you do matrix it depends you have to think about your data representation you can with this expand it and go in and look at various bits you can explore it 
But the main thing I do is I will sometimes have a function that's running slow. I will highlight it, profile it, and just work out which bit, and then go stack overflow to say, how do I speed up this bit? And it's sometimes not what you expect. What I mean by that is, let's look at this. Let's say I want to calculate means. And I've got means, I could do the um, apply, which we learned last time. So I'm basically calculating, in this case, column means. I could use the column means function, I could do an L apply or a V apply. So these are all various ways of doing the same thing. And maybe this is the part, once you've profiled it, that's slowing it all down. Let me go back to that. And it's going to run them. And then it spits them out. So they all look pretty equivalent. I told you apply last time was really, really good. Better than a for loop, it's not really, really good. You can now see that, you know, apply is taking 1540. In fact, if you really want to get your columns mean, the best one you can do is the L apply. I don't use this very much. To be honest, just code is really slow. Usually it's the mean and obvious. You type the letters FOR, which just shouldn't have done that. Or you just write it as RCPP. That pretty well gets what you need to sort out. But the problem is when I say really slow, I must admit my code takes more than eight seconds, I get bored. And I can spend two days making it run in six seconds, so I'm an idiot. But if you do have a function and you just can't change it, you're just going, what's happening here? Do the profiling, look where it's going wrong, then you can actually think about how to speed it up. Most of the time, vectorize it. The ones where you just need a for loop, use RCPP. So much better. Cool. So if you really want to have a go, So, um, how fast can you get the code? So have a look at that code. If you want to have a challenge, see how fast you can get it. So, highlight it, profile it, find what's slow, find a faster way, highlight it, profile it, find out what's slow, see if you can do it, see if you can actually get better. The classic example I had of this was a workshop I went to the user conference and they were doing game of life. The thing that slowed their game of life down was none of the calculations, it was drawing rectangles on the screen. And once we changed how we plotted it, it basically completely changed it from something that would not work to something that worked in seconds. And I would never have realized, the guy was really good, he just went, let's highlight it. What do you think is going to slow it down? And more like, well, you've got this horrible for loop, you fool, how could you? And he went, no. And when we highlighted it, it was the drawing the rectangles on the screen for the game of life that was messing it up. Did you build the game of life in R? What? Did you build it in R? Yes. It's just an example of profiling. He wanted something that, I think he just wanted a classic example of what's slowing down this code is not what you think it's slowing down this code. It's fun. Just let it say. Just say, it's playing with it for a while and make it fast. I mean, that's what we did. We just took this game of life code I mean, we would just highlight it and go, oh, that's the bad, bad bit, go back, highlight it, that's the bad bit. And we went from, you know, it wasn't going to run at all down to it was running really, really fast. Simple things like eventually we just went, I don't need to see the pictures, let's just see the pictures like after every 200 cycles. And it's suddenly sped up, stuff like that. That's the take home message is where you think your code is slow is probably not where it is slow, it's worth our profile again. Or is it with profiling you can speed up life? Pardon? Or is it with profiling you can speed up your life? Yes. Get it over and done with. I'm straight car. through, got to get straight through to the Werther's Originals and the smoking a pipe and go, oh, that was good. Yeah, I find my car's a bit slow, but I can profile and get speed up that a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think you find like all problems with coding and life, that the main problem is not the code, but the person who was inputting it. There is, there is, Nigel often talks about there's code time and there's your time. Like seriously, I have spent two days to save like, you know, 15 seconds. But that's because I like fapping. But that two days, you could have just done a hell of a lot of other stuff if you just sat on a computer and let it run. Any questions? That's really it. I mean, have a go at code. I would highly recommend the next time you have a slow function, you write it as RCPP. The main point of RCPP is the inertia, the sense of I just can't do it. And it's actually not that hard. I, I, I forget every time, and when I part it, pass it across, it doesn't take very long to get it open. Um, there is a book. The guy who invented this is. It was the guy we saw on that cheat sheet before. Um, Dirk Edelbutel is the guy who does this. He writ he's written a whole use R book on it. It's not your best resource. Absolutely not. I bought the book. I was so excited. I read the book. My excitement had gone a lot. The best resource I find for RCPP is the Advanced R by Hadley on his website. It's probably got a nice set of just his examples of pretty well everything you'll need. The other thing you actually have is C++ comes with what we call the standard template library. So it has a lot of built-in optimization concepts. It's got some of the stuff you find like tree structures, binary trees, um, hash functions, what they're called nameless in C++, but the equivalent of dictionaries in Python, these are all built in. You've got iterators as well, all this is there. So if you need to start doing advanced coding, you don't have to code it yourself, it's already there, built in, and you have access to it to run a CPP. It's also got some very good optimization routines. If you want to know all about that, go to Hadley's Advanced R. So I have done things like network algorithms in C++ and they've worked very nicely for cracks out of the box because I had things like um, binary hash tables, some of the stuff you need to do your network algorithms. Cool. That's it. Next time we will do data table which is fast dplyr, which will be really useful for your DNA methylation problem, which is in assignment three, where you're gonna look at ancient DNA.